For those, thank you. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a retired state senator Joe Neal. I served this state for, <laughs> for 32 years. And there's a book out about me called The West Side Slugger. It was written by John Smith, who used to be with the RJ papers. So if you want to know more about me, you can get the book because he can get a very good story. It's a pleasure for me to night to introduce a person whom I have admired from a distance, and I just met her the first time this evening, who I think would make a very good president. And as I think about this occasion, the thoughts occurred to me this evening that I was thinking about the poet T.S. Eliot when he was a young man at Princeton. He was called upon to write an essay on Dante's Inferno, Dante's Hell. To those who don't know what Dante's Inferno was, Dante's Hell. And his conclusion was that in Dante's Inferno, nothing connect. So therefore, he said that hell is something that does not connect. So ladies and gentlemen, you know that our country now is in a hell of a mess. There's a disconnect between the people of this government, and not only that, through other governments in the world. So it's time for us to say to the present captain of this ship of state, those words that he embedded in our minds many, many years ago, you're fired. As I watched for over two years, the floundering ship of state in the seas of corruption, lies, and indecision, it's time for us to get a new captain. And ladies and gentlemen, I offer to you a person who has risen from the depths of the strata of the working poor to become a teacher of education and also to become an instructor of law at one of our most prestigious institutions of law in this country, Harvard University. And she ran and was elected as a U.S. Senator for the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, state of Massachusetts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I offer to you a person who has traveled the road from the working poor up to the status that she has now, but she didn't forget about the people. She built a road map, and when she reached her station, where she felt that she had accomplished something, she extended a hand back to the people of West Washington and herself. And I, for one, respected this lady and saw her stand up when Obama was elected to the presidency of these United States. And he was faced with a government that was headed into a depression. He called upon Elizabeth Warren to help him keep this great state, a nation, on course. She extended a hand to help him create what was called the Consumer Protection Bureau. But after she finished developing that for Obama, he wanted to point her to head as director of this agency. 
But the Republican-controlled Senate said, no, that is not going to happen. They, they knew what they were in for if she had become director of that particular agency. So they put a stop order on her being appointed. But then she said, if you do not want me to function in the executive branch, maybe I should function in your house. <laughs> so she ran for the U.S. Senate against a very popular Republican. A man, when she entered the race, she was 17 points behind him. 17 points. And he had beat another woman in his Republican Party to get into the general election. And he put our candidate up just to hold the vote. But she had other things in mind. She ran her own campaign. And what she did was something that was marvelous. When she went out campaigning, every little girl she met, she bowed down on her knees and said, I'm Elizabeth Warren and I'm running for the US Senate because that's what little girls do. She is a person that we think that can extricate this ship of state from the waters of lies, corruption, and indecision. The ship of state that at times has found itself laden on the banks of prejudice and disgrace to a nation. I offer to you a new captain to be of our great state of this union, whom I think would do a marvelous job. She has the wherewithal to function at the top. Because after being called by Obama to head of this agency in which the Republicans denied her that opportunity, she is now applying for the job not to be a deckhand on the ship of state, but to be the captain of that ship. And I think that she can do a mother's job in removing the foreign hands from the tiller of control and set us on course again to a more perfect union. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer to you our captain to be Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Uh, to, to be able to do this. 
You know, I, I want to say a little thing at the top about a plan I have. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, yeah, there are a lot of them, but one in particular that I wanted to talk about today is I've, I've just introduced a new bill uh, in the Senate, and it has to do with our military families. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a bit, but all three of my brothers were in the military. Anybody in here either in the military, love somebody who was in the military? We've got a few military. Yeah. Yeah, we've got folks here. So, um, as you know, it's both our active duty service members, but it's also their families who give up a lot and go where they're needed because that's what it means. They sign on to put their whole lives on the line. And one of the things that we promise to do on the government side is we try to provide for the family, and that includes military housing, on-base military housing. Well, it was discovered back in the 90s that military housing had really just fallen apart. We hadn't been spending money, hadn't been taking care of it, so it was really falling apart. And so what did the government do? Repair it? No. Uh, they did private contracts with a handful of contractors and said, we'll pay you a bunch of money, you fix it up, and then you manage on-base military housing. And they now do it. About 99% of family housing on bases is handled by just a handful of companies. Well, it came out in an investigation a few months back now that what they've been doing is a mess. And a lot of military housing, it's rat infested, cockroach infested. Uh, there are stories about feces and urine and burst pipes and ceilings that have fallen down, uh, places that have got mold all over it, places that have been flooded and not cleaned up properly. But the contractors continue to get their bonuses for doing a great job. And so uh, as this information's come out, I just thought, you know, this is one more place where we just need a little more accountability. So this new bill that I've put in, first of all, says we're going to get some accountability from these big contractors that are running these deals. If they're not providing the services, how about for openers they don't get paid? Yeah. A second part of this is to say let's give military families some rights. So this bill has a tenant bills of a bill of rights, including if they're not providing habitable housing, then you don't actually have to pay the rent. You can withdraw and hold the rent. Right? And the third part that's really bad about this is there are a lot of families that have suffered health problems uh, because of the housing conditions they're living in. And so what I've put in the bill is to say, if you've got a health problem or your children did that can be traced to this substandard housing, then you're going to get, you're going to get medical care from the government, whether you're still active duty or whether that's behind you. But we owe an obligation to people who get sick in housing that we are obligated to provide. So, I just wanted to mention at the top because it's another chance to say that we're grateful to people who volunteer to serve. We're grateful to their families. But you don't just show your gratitude with words. You show your gratitude with action. And that means we're going to honor our promises. So I thought what we do while we're here together, boy, it's good to see so many people here. This could be fun. I'm just going to keep doing this. I can do this. Only in Vegas, baby. <laughs> so um, I thought what I'd do is I'd talk a little bit, tell you about who I am, where I came from, why I'm in this fight. We'll take some questions. Victoria, a student at UNLV, is going to come out. She'll do uh, uh, call on people for questions. And then if anybody wants to stay and do a picture, we'll stay and do a picture. That's fine. <laughs> By the way, with family, uh, I have my son Alex here. Alex, stand up. Alex has been my tech support 
since second grade. It's true. It's true. Uh, and he's, he has some computer business now, but he's trying a second role, and that is support mom while she runs for president of the United States. It's, uh, in Oklahoma. We have any Okies? Yeah, all right, good. We got a few. All right, good, good. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Ooh. Them's fighting words. <laughs> Actually, I taught at UT for years, so uh, it was always a kind of funny thing around football games. So, um, but I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have three much older brothers. Uh, to this day, they are referred to as the boys. Uh, they're all retired, but they're still called the boys. Um, I have three uh, older brothers. I was what used to be referred to as a late-in-life baby. <laughs> My mother always just called me the surprise, um, which is true. Um, all three of my brothers went off and joined the military. My oldest brother, Don Reed, was career military. He spent off and on about five, five and a half years in Vietnam in combat. We were very lucky to get him back home. Um, my second brother, John, was stationed overseas for a little over a year. My third brother, David, trained as a combat medic. Now, um, this actually raises issues in our family to this day. Uh, everyone in the family knows never choke around David. Uh, <laughs> He carries a sharpened pocket knife, and he is convinced he can perform an emergency tracheotomy. Just give him a chance. Yeah, it makes for some very exciting times at Thanksgiving. You know, someone goes, <clears throat> and we all just back out of the room. Uh, I love my brothers. They all still live now. They're back in Oklahoma. They've all retired. And um, when we were growing up, our daddy had a lot of different jobs. He sold um, carpet. He sold paint, he sold fencing, he sold hardware, uh, housewares. Uh, and when I was in middle school, uh, the boys were all gone by then, and it was just my mother and my daddy and me. And my daddy had a massive heart attack, and we thought he was going to die. Um, neighbors brought covered dishes. Uh, it was a bad time. He pulled through, but he couldn't work for a long, long time. And uh, we lost our family station wagon. And at night, my mama would tuck me into bed. And then um, I could hear them talk. They thought I was asleep. And that's when I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. And one morning, I walked into my folks' bedroom. And there on the bed was the dress. Now, some of you in this room will know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And there's my mama, and she's in her slip and her stocking feet. The dress is laid out, and she's pacing, and she's crying. And she's saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She had never worked outside the home. And she was terrified. And she cried a while longer. And I'm just standing there. I'm just a kid. And she looks at me. And she looks at that dress. And back at me. And at the dress. And finally, she wipes her face. She pulls that dress on. She puts on her high heels. And she walks to the Sears and gets a minimum wage job, answering phones. And that minimum wage job saved our house, and it saved our family. And for many, many years, I believe that was just what my mother taught me. And that is, it doesn't matter when you're scared, when it looks hard, you reach down deep, you find what you need to find, you pull it up, and you take care of the people you love. And it was years later I came to understand 
that wasn't just our family's story. It was the story of millions of people all around this country who, when it gets tough, when it gets scary, they reach down deep, they find what they need to find, they pull it up, and they do what they have to do to take care of the people they love. And it was only years after that that I came to understand. It was also a story about government. Because when I was a girl, a full-time minimum wage job in America would support a family of three. It would pay a mortgage, it would cover the utilities, and it would put food on the table. Today, a minimum wage job in America will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. That is wrong, and that is why I am in this fight. gravity. The reason for that change is decision made in Washington. Back when I was a girl, you can go back and actually look at the records. The question that Congress asked every time they reset the minimum wage is what does it take a family of three to survive? To get a toehold in America's middle class, a place they can build from. Today, the question that is asked in Washington is what level minimum wage will maximize the profits of giant multinational corporations? Well, I don't want a government that works for national corporations. I want a government that works for our families. to do since second grade. I have. This is a trick. I've, I've known since second grade. I know some of you didn't decide till third grade. <laughs> Fourth. Some of the guys probably fifth or sixth. You know? But I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's <laughs> Public School Teacher? dollies and teach school. I was tough but fair. I was good. By the time I graduated from high school, my family didn't have the money for a college application, much less money to send me off to college. Um, but I was determined and I got lucky. I got a scholarship to college. Yay! I fell in love. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got married to the first husband. <laughs> and I dropped out of school and got a job answering phones. And I thought that would be my life. A good life, but not the one I dreamed about. And then I found a commuter college, 45 minutes away, and a semester's tuition cost 50 bucks. Think about that. And so for the price that I could cover on a part-time waitressing job, I got a chance to get a four-year diploma. I graduated and I became a special needs teacher. I have lived my dream. teachers know what I'm talking about. It's a calling. And I would probably still be doing that today, except by the end of the first year, I was noticeably pregnant. And the principal did what principals did back in those days. Wished me luck, showed me the door, and hired somebody else for a job. So, I'm at home. I got a baby. I can't work full time. Nobody will hire me. And I figure out what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to law school. <laughs> so I head off to law school, baby on hip, 
Four years later, I graduate from law school, visibly pregnant. You will detect a pattern here. <laughs> that was this guy. Uh, and graduate from law school and practice law for 45 minutes. <laughs> Maybe an hour, but I don't think so. Uh, and went back to my first love, teaching. Uh, I traded short ones for tall ones and taught for pretty much the rest of my life. Now, I taught all the money courses. Growing up the way I did, this is what I wanted to understand best. I taught contract law and commercial law and corporate finance and bankruptcy and all those pieces. But there was one central question that I always focused on, that I was always, in, everything revolved around for me. And that is, what's happening to working families in this country? Why is America's middle class being hollowed out? How is it that people who work every bit as hard as my mother worked, today find the road is so much rockier and so much steeper? And for families of color, even rockier and even steeper. And the answer, it's like the one on the minimum wage. It's not an accident. It's about who government works for. So we live in an America today that works great. Our government is fabulous for giant drug companies, just not for people trying to get a prescription filled. It's an America that works great for huge financial institutions, just not people trying to make it paycheck to paycheck without getting ripped off. It's an America that works fabulously for giant oil, well co oil companies that want to drill everywhere, but not for people who see climate change bearing down upon us. Yep. When you've got a government that works great for those with money and not for everyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple, and we need to call it out for what it is. Corruption. And understand this, whatever issue brought you here today, whatever's the one that gets you up early in the morning, that keeps you up late at night, if there is a decision to be made in Washington, it has been influenced by money. It has been pushed on by money. It has been touched by money. You know, I want to give you an example of that. Back in the 1990s, go back and take a look. We're beginning to understand as a country climate change. We don't fully have the words. The science is not as complete as it is today. But we know something's not right. And we're starting to get the data, the information about what's wrong. So what happens? Democrats and Republicans, they're starting to work together. What do we need to do to make sure this is not a catastrophe bearing down upon us? That's the question they're working on. And then along come the Koch brothers. <laughs> they make their money in carbon-based energy, right? And let's be fair, along come the oil companies, along come some big corporations that believe it's a lot cheaper to be able to put your poison in the air and your filth in the water, right? They come along and they say, in effect, you know, if Congress gets really serious about making sure we have a clean earth, cleaning up some of these activities, that's going to cost us money. So they have a choice. They're going to make an investment here. One investment they could make is scrubbers and cleaners and ways to capture the carbon so it doesn't go into the air, it doesn't go into the water, right? That's one option. Another option is to say, you know, we could stop our carbon-based fuel investments and we could invest more in clean energy, starting now. We could invent more of it, we could take our money and move it over there. Or there's a third way that they could invest money. And this is the one they chose. They invested in politicians. They invested in Washington. They invested in getting Washington to do nothing. And how did they do it? 
Oh, one big part, bought and paid for experts who would come in for a price and raise doubts about climate. Why? Not because these guys didn't know what the reality was, but because it gave just enough umbrella that the politicians who were getting the campaign contributions, right, who were getting the cushy jobs after they left Congress, that they could all continue to do nothing. So you want to understand why we face the climate crisis we face in 2018? It's because of corruption that's been going on for 25 years in Washington. That's why. a big problem in this country. And we are not going to solve this by one off on the statute. You know, we'll pass one little law over here, and you've got another proposal over there, a couple of regulations over here. We need big structural change in this country. Structural change. And I want to give you three ideas for how we can do it. The first one, attack corruption head on. Call it out and go after it. Yep, straight in. Now here's the good news. I have the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. The bad news, we need the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. So it's got a lot of moving parts to it, because it is big because there's a lot of different ways that money gets spent. So let me just give you some taste, okay? Just a few of the pieces. Here's one. End lobbying as we know it. <laughs> Stop the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. Enough. States Supreme Court follow basic rules of ethics on climate. Okay, just one more. I could do these all night long, but just one more on this. That would really help expose a lot of corruption. And that is anybody, anybody who wants to run for public federal office should have to put their tax returns on the line. Okay, that's one. Okay, attack corruption, head on. Two. We gotta change some basic rules in this economy. Okay, we just gotta change some of the structure in it. So here's the first part. We got a problem with giant corporations down this country. They just basically roll. And they roll wherever they want, however they want, no matter who gets in the way. They just keep right on going. They roll over their own employees, they roll over their customers, they roll over the communities where they're located. And the only way that's going to stop is if there's somebody that's also got power to check that. And it's not just the government. We need employees to have more power, and that means make it easier to join a union and give unions more power.